COP28 Dubai, live here in the green zone. Dr. Zach Bush, so excited. 1.5 Media and Allied for Future. We have this rare opportunity. Zach is so busy traveling around the world and we're honored to have just watched his session here in the Sustainability Pavilion from Slovenia by Convergence. Wow, absolutely amazing what he had to say. Thank you for being here mm. and taking the time to speak with us. Awesome to be here. Can I just ask you, why COP? Why are you here? How did this happen? Uh, yeah, I've actually been relatively resistant to being here over the years it, it, just because I couldn't find like the calling to, that felt quite right. And then last year I was called by a group of indigenous wisdom keepers to come to uh, the space in Egypt right before COP27. And uh, we held five days of ceremony there to reset the energy of, of the community there, the, the country of Egypt, as well as the, the institution of COP, uh, with this indigenous wisdom that was coming out from this group. And that was something that really set me in motion in a different direction, I think. And it wasn't a coincidence or a surprise when a year later, a few really aligned invitations came in uh, to get me here this time. So I think there's a, a vibration of remembrance of where we're coming from as humanity uh, that's going to start to retune our understanding of crisis into opportunity. You spoke downstairs a lot about regeneration, about our biome, about diversity. Can you maybe give us a few sound bites or some kind of ticklings um, of, of what you did? I don't want you to repeat it sure. all, but I'd, lo we'd, I'd love to give a little sampling of what message you're bringing here for everyone. Yeah. I think that one of the big pieces that we need to start to look at as a, as a world right now, as an industry of humanity, we need to start to understand that the politicization and the storytelling that's been given to us around global warming and climate change, as it's now been termed, are really measuring the symptoms rather than the cause of change on the earth right now. And for a lot of that, it's because we've started to be reductionist in our definition of our situation as a chemistry problem rather than a biology problem. Chemistry is a description of the CO2 in the atmosphere or the amount of sodium in my bloodstream or whatever it is, but it fails to recognize that the process of chemistry coming into life is really reliant on biology rather than some sort of chemical basis of, of balance or imbalance. It's never chemistry imbalance that screws up biology or leads to extinction. It's always a, a failure of the biology that leads to a screw up of the chemistry. And so when we have governments starting to focus and then you know companies and everything else on CO2 in the atmosphere as our crisis, we've been on a 30-year journey of distraction into the fact that we simply killed the lungs of the planet, which is our soil systems worldwide. We have now denuded 97% of our arable land, our farmable land around the world over this process. And interestingly, we did that by changing farming practices from biologic systems to chemical systems again. And so it was chemical inputs for decades, and in fact, generations of farmers that have destroyed that 97% of those arable soils. And for that, we lost the lungs of the planet. And when the lungs of the planet can no longer breathe in, we get an accumulation of CO2 in the atmosphere. And there's a medical condition very similar to this, which is called emphysema, the failure of the lung. And the symptom of emphysema at the chemistry level is a rise in CO2 in the bloodstream. But if you go and try to pull the CO2 out of the bloodstream of the individual, you actually kill them very quickly. And so this is my concern right now, as we have technologies and industries and governments now saying that we need to pay engineers to suck the CO2 out of the atmosphere and bury it in the ground, when in fact that chemistry is the next breath of the planet. And so when we stop killing the soils with our chemistry, allow biology to return, the earth is gonna take a very deep breath. And every time she does this, she recovers from extinction with new life, new biodiversity and new beauty. And for that, we can look back to that last extinction 55 million years ago. It was a death of the topsoils. It was a death of the lungs of the planet from an asteroid that struck, buried the soils of the earth in dust. And what has now emerged is something so far more beautiful and far more intelligent than existed before that moment. And so every time this earth has held her breath, it is for the purpose of an explosion of life to come next. And so I'm very excited for us to realize that we don't have a a climate crisis, we have a biologic collapse that's setting us up 
for the next rebirth of this planet. And so that regenerative reality that we're stepping into is this awesome moment where life is going to be more beautiful than we can imagine. The only question left is, do we get to see it? I, I really hope we do get to see it and there's no better way that you just formulate it. You know, I'm glad to hear that you were a COP27 shaman shake and kind of participated. Was it the Sikkim, Sikkim groups and that event? It was Earthrise Collective. Earthrise, yeah. wow, yeah. beautiful. Yeah. I, I was also at COP27 and, and it was quite yeah. a thing. We had the biggest movement of food pavilions and ag there for in the record of COP, so five to six. Now more than 50% of the pavilion's discussions here, agriculture, food systems, restoring that biodiversity, getting rid of chemicals, getting off of fossil fuels, kind of changing that narrative, more discussions about regenerative practices, so, uh, just singing to my heart and mm -hmm. exactly the direction where we need to go, Zach. We're here, you know, in the green zone, have this beautiful backdrop, it's loud, there's other pavilions, things going on, but we're at COP asking two really big, important questions. One is a meme, it's a twist on a meme, up half full, that optimistic perspective. What is your COP half full, mm -hmm. your optimistic perspective? Is it doom and gloom or is there some glimmer of hope uh, with this COP process? As far as I can tell from a biologic standpoint, with my background in, as a medical doctor, my third subspecialty was in hospice and palliative care. And I experienced this in the ICUs when I was in doing internal medicine, working in hospital systems, that there was never a death that was actually anything but beautiful. And I, I, you get to start to see through the veil beyond the anthropocentric kind of human belief systems of our reality. And as we let go of these biologic systems that we call a body, we move into our physical state. Our, we go from biology to physics. And in that physics, we become non-local and we become connected to everything. And so we move from the finite to the infinite in our death process. And so this is something beautiful if you've ever sat with an elder uh, and at the bedside as they're starting to let go of, of body and become full spirit is it's not unusual that their skin almost becomes translucent where you feel like you can see light coming through that fine wrinkled skin. And I'm a little concerned that we're putting so much energy into our fear of aging these days because our fear of death and our fear of aging I think is really at our root of our inability to be alive. If we're so afraid of death, we cannot live. In the same way, if we're so enthralled by the you know, dismal storytelling of that kind of apocalyptic or post-apocalyptic periods that we're moving into, we're forgetting that we can actually be alive before we die. And this is my hope for this moment. We are now on our hospice diagnosis as a species. We've been given 60 to 80 years left of fertility and some of these other key metrics for survival. And so if we're in those last few gasps of a species, my hope is that we become one of those beautiful hospice moments that regardless as to whether that person passes away or not, they become ethereal, they become non-local and they connect to everything. They become part of that energy field and they get to share that wisdom back to the family that sits by the bedside. And so I hope that I, as I let go of this body, I'm sitting with my proverbial human, but also planetary family. I hope that the birds and the sunsets and the sunrises that witness my last few breaths are informed by my dissolution. And so this is what our species gets to do, is we're going to dissolve in death, either as individuals or as a species. The question is, are we gonna be awake enough to leave the information behind? And then just from that little selfish standpoint, 10% of our patients that get uh, admitted to the hospice service have to be discharged because they realize how to live in their diagnosis of death. Isn't that and beautiful? So this is our 10% chance. Is can we be discharged from hospice as we become so translucent that the light comes through each of us and we see each other's beauty for the first time for what it is and we suddenly resonate in a love state that just penetrates all of the trauma and transforms, transmutes the genomics, the proteomics, the whole damage done transmutes in a moment in this new vibration for seeing the translucence in each of us as we reach this hospice moment. So maybe we'd be just discharged. That resonates with me and, and Dina behind the camera and, and I'm sure with everybody, I truly hope for that more than 10% that will see the light and have that resonance that we can be discharged into a better future. The last and hardest question I have for you uh, is an old Bucky question. It's been around for over 70 years. 
What does a world that works for everyone look like for you, Zach? I just launched a new nonprofit called the Institute of Natural Law in kind of an understanding of what this might look like. Uh, after years of studying biology and the microbiome and everything else, it's become very clear that life follows these very basic tenets. And if we start to design a socio-political system, socio-economic system, in fact a whole society based on natural law, we will become so resilient and regenerative because we will be iterating all of the time for a higher level of beauty, higher level of intelligence for the collective capacity for biodiversification at the dinner table, at the space within your companies, at the space within your school systems and learning systems. Biodiversification is all these little centric ecosystems that we create and human society will create this more verdant version of humanity and so I really believe that this is a rebirth process that we're in the midst of and but we're not going to be able to figure out how to do that until we grasp the fundamentals of natural law and so, uh, for me that some of those basic tenets come down to decentralization decentralization and autonomy are required for sovereignty to occur at the individual level. And at the human cell level, this can be seen. Each human cell is sovereign. It can create its own energy. It can, it's can. it got all the enzymes for repair and regeneration, but it doesn't actually express human until it's in its entire ecosystem of biodiverse organs, biodiverse species within the gut and skin and everything else. And so sovereign at the cell level then allows for this community event to happen and in, in the microbiology we call this quorum sensing where suddenly an ecosystem of bacteria and fungi exhibits a hyper intelligent moment and it starts to create something far greater and far more complex than any of the constituents could have done on their own and so this is our moment of can we become quorum sensing as a human species and I think we may have come out of this. A lot of indigenous cultures, I think, were tapped into this telepathic communication across the planet, were tapped into biodiverse information streams, even though they couldn't travel and they didn't have the cell phone and everything else. And so I think we're rediscovering this capacity to move beyond technology that we would hold in our hands and realize that it is our hands and our hugs that are the primary technology we need to move forward with. It's the human touch that needs to come back into our future. And as we touch each other, embrace each other, and hold each other, we are going to exchange so much information that we will defy the, the capacity of any quantum chip or AI out there with the amount of information we can create and exchange. And, and the creative capacity that can come out of that exchange, I think, is just unimaginable right now for the fractured state of our human society. And so as each being becomes sovereign, they start to practice the second law of natural law, which is attraction. You will attract to you all of the other sources of information, people's resources and everything else that you need to be in your highest expression of self. And so sovereignty followed by that attraction, which recognizes the importance of polarity. My positive charge attracts your negative charge so that we can create chemistry between us so that we can supercharge the biology among us. So, it's a, a fun possibility that we could start to reimagine societies in the context of natural law. I'm so glad that you exist, that you're uh, giving this attraction, creating these things and sharing this wisdom with us, and especially here at the COP where it's needed more than anywhere, that we can get that out there. We're just a small little piece of the pie, but it really needs to be much bigger. Thank you so much for letting us inside of your ideas, for revealing these things to us. Um, we'll list uh, your links in the show notes and in, in the video notes. And I wish you a successful time here in Dubai and, and much love. Thank you so wow, much, Zach. Thank you, brother. I, I appreciate it. Thank you. 1.5 Media, knowledge uh, allied for future and uh, knowledge and connection and attraction is really powerful. Thank you so much.